So hello and welcome to another episode of Interviews with Experts. I'm Frederick Dunn and this is The Way to Be. Today my guest is Dr. Umberto Boncristiani. His YouTube channel is Inside the Hive TV. You'll want to get comfortable and settle in because we're about to cover a lot of ground in this interview. From varroa mites in Australia to the upcoming release of the first ever honeybee vaccine against American fowl brood by Dalen Animal Health Incorporated. Here's Dr. Umberto Boncristiani. Uh, hi, Fred. Uh, I'm Dr. Umberto Boncristiani. I'm a private consultant for the beekeeping industry, a honeybee researcher. I run a YouTube channel called Inside the Hive TV on YouTube. And now I'm working for the company that's going to bring the first vaccine for honeybee ever created. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, Umberto, thank you so much uh, for being here. I'm glad you accepted my invitation to have a conversation because, you know, a lot of uh, things on a much deeper level than most backyard beekeepers do. And those are even in the beekeeping industry. We don't understand often what's going on in the microbiome of the bees and everything else. So I'm really glad that you're here. I watch your YouTube channel. I hope other people do too. And if you're watching right now and you've never checked into Inside the Hive TV, it's one of the most under visited YouTube channels I know of related to bee issues. So I highly recommend you follow the link down in the video description and visit Inside the Hive TV and you'll be blown away. So <laughs> with you. that out of the way, there's so much that we want to talk about. And uh, so those of you, if you're watching or if you're listening on Podbean, the way to be, uh, this could be a long one because uh, Umberto told me I have no time limit. So you better watch out. This could go beyond 20 minutes. Really? Oh, we okay. can stay here forever so, talking beats. Yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, this is also part human interest. I like to find out things about people that maybe other interviewers haven't discovered. So I like, uh, we already know that we have common ground. We're photographers, we're professional photographers, uh, portraiture primarily, right? Yep. And you're a CPP. A lot of people don't know what that is, but that's a certified professional photographer with the uh, Professional Photographers Association here in the United States, they don't hand that stuff out easily. So, that's true. scientist, researcher, portrait, image maker. That's me. Oh. That's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm impressed that you, you figured my CPP title too. Uh, I forgot that I'm a CPP. <sighs> oh, was, yeah. Well, <laughs> it was seven, 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's it's something that the Professional Photographers Association wants everybody to get that because it it kind of ups the level. I believe you have to renew, don't you? Yeah, you need to uh, renew yeah. every three years. I don't think I think my expired, uh, but I think as to give a little bit of context to the people at home, you know, there is a lot of photographers out there that you know first time they got their cameras and they think they're pro professionals and they want to make money on that. So the, the Professional Photographers of America decide to create a certification program where they, I, I, I need to go there. There is a, there is a, a theoretical test, a knowledgeable test, a practical test. So to make sure you deliver every single time. And I, I decide to take it and it's, it's not easy. <laughs> it wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy at all. Yeah, it shouldn't be easy because if you want to be a certified professional, here's the only problem. As you just mentioned, you're surprised that I knew what a CPP was. Um, photographers know what it is. The consumer doesn't. So they, yeah. never, they never ask. I've been doing professional photography forever. No one has ever once said, where did you get your diploma in photography from? Yeah. What credentials do you have? No, they just care about the portfolio that you put online. And uh, if somebody yeah. sitting there right now wants to see some photography that you've done, where would they go to see it? Boncristianiphotography.com. Okay, we're going to put that link down in the video description too for the shutter bugs that are out there because there's a lot of them in beekeeping too because photography skills can pay off in beekeeping. Yep. Hey, that's, that's, a very macro, nice. that's a double macro image of a bee on a dandelion that I shot with the Z9 this very year. Very nice. Very nice. So photography applies to everything. If you're a researcher, visual 
references are so much more powerful. Somebody might say worth a thousand words. I'm sure we're the first to say that. So, <laughs> so let's get started. Um, you are originally from where? I'm originally from Brazil. Okay. Sao Paulo State, Sao Paulo City. And that's where you went to school. I went to school, yeah, I finished my, my whole education there until my PhD. I finished there. That was 2006. That was when the CCD, Colony Collapse Disorder, mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. So the USDA was looking for a virologist, which is what I was doing my PhD, vaccines for viruses for kids and for humans. And they're looking for a virologist that have experience background with beekeeping. And at that time, I think I was the only guy on the planet because I'm a second generation beekeeper in my family. That's interesting. Now, so 2006, that's another parallel. We're not just photographers. We both started with bees. Well, you got your degree then. So you were finishing up. If you're getting your PhD by that level, I'm just going to guess that your PhD was in cellular and molecular biology. Yes, with emphasis in virologist. Yeah. Okay. I'm a molecular in and virology. cell biologist. Yeah. Okay. That was a pretty good guess on my part. Yeah, yeah. You were a pretty good guesser. <laughs> okay. Now, I do want to say something else, too, because I think when you were little, you mentioned that you were around bees, like you're a multi-generational beekeeping family. But you weren't too excited about it. You want to share some anecdotes? Yeah, yeah. It, it is. The, my story with bees are kind of funny. Uh, some people uh, at the beginning, I got stung the first time I was four years old. And I kind of remember that still. It was a very traumatizing thing. And when you, when you grow around the Africanized bees, things are different when you're a kid. Uh, you get caught many times and sometimes, you know, I'm a very passionate about my pets and I lost a dog when I was a kid. So I wasn't very happy with the bees. So for my, and my father kept me working in the farm. And so I, I wasn't, my, my relationship with the bees was not very, I like, was just like a brother, let's put that way. You know, we fight, fight, fight sometimes. But when something happened with the bees, that what happened in 2006. I try to avoid the bees my whole career and the bees always come back somehow. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, it was a, a course, but uh, when I got here and it seemed the progression of my career, I think was a blessing and it was my call. I know people in Florida likes to say that that was my call and I couldn't see it at the time. And, and today I give up. I'm a bee person. I'm going to stay for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it is funny how you never know what's going to happen with you, but the bees always come back. I always try to move away and it's always come back. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that the bees actually killed your dog? Yep. So what was going on? Was your dog tethered? Uh, Just... We always have our precautions uh, to when you, before we go to the yard and we, we, we lock out the dogs. But there is always there is one that is a little dumber than the others and they follow us and he was very happy and he jumped and he dropped one of the hives and that was and then they chase for the ch yeah it's not a if you ever work with africanized bees you know what i'm talking about uh they can chase you in high quantities very fast they can build up the attack it's not an easy way to get rid of them yeah yeah, and their defensive response is really extreme. Like yeah. the number of guards that respond from a colony of Africanized bees that come after you is, is a huge <laughs> number. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, the distance that they'll travel to defend their area. Uh, could you tie that in a little bit? Tell us like what kind of distance are we talking about? Because often backyard beekeepers will say, oh, those are Africanized bees for sure. They followed me all the way across my yard. Uh, I don't think they realize that they would actually follow you 300 yeah, yards or they, 200 yards. Yeah, they go over and over. I, I, I have a video. I don't have it here, but I I did a demonstration live, not live, I, but I was like, let's put this way. They chase you, let's see, a whole, even more than a uh, football field. Mm -hmm. You can go, keep going. They can keep chasing you. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it takes about half an hour or so for them to start to forget you when you're far away, but they still there, bzz, buzz, mm-hmm. buzzing, buzzing. Yeah. Uh, of course, that you know every yard is different, as you probably know. The bees have some kind of mood. Uh, but my father, in special for whatever reason, he liked it to keep them. Uh, how the people say in United States to keep them hot, hot bees. Mm-hmm. The the more aggressive, more defensive, the better for him. He said that he never had problems with the bees when they are easy when they know how to defend themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of bees that we have in our yard. There we we're small beekeeper. We have never reach a uh, commercial beekeeping in South America is the numbers are very different what we consider commercial beekeepers in the United States we have around 90 colonies maximum or mm. something like that and it was just for honey production and we we sell all our things together we pack and go to the cities and it was me knocking people's door and offer offering our honey and that, that was that was the time long long time ago so, so you mentioned 90 hives was there a limit uh set by the government there or anything mm, or did you no it's, as as you it's, wanted? it's just what we could handle um with the equipment that we have and location that we we got there is no much at that time there was no much transportation of bees around too much mm-hmm. um so we always kept our yards in specific places that we know were good, and that's the that's it. That's there is there is no much like the commercial beekeeping uh, culture here in the United States mm-hmm. that we go travel long distances chasing uh, uh, some different honeys and things like that. It was more family. Um, a family business. So you wouldn't say there's a lot of migratory pollination services down there, for example? Not at that time, but today things are starting to get different. Uh, There is even some companies now. I start to build that. Um, I was consulting for one of those uh, because it's a completely different ball game to transport those Africanized bees. They Mm -hmm. swarm much faster too. So there is protocols that we need to figure it out how to how are we going to get, you know, because here it's easy to transport those bees. They're kind of gentle. They're very gentle and you go dif- biggest different uh, distances. But there, uh, you know, every time you mess with them, the, the chances for them to swarm and go away is higher. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. then we, we, we can lose a lot of hives if you don't know how to play with them. Now, would it be safe to say that the feral colonies in that area are now all Africanized just because of how yeah. much they can displace other bees? Yes, very much. Okay. Uh, I, th- th- there are some beekeepers that try to introduce gen- uh, Italians back. Uh, so they try to keep a different genetic background, but they always need to be replacing because mm-hmm. the Africanization, the Africanized bees... Uh, the genetic they develop to survive in, in Africa really, really powerful to take over this uh, South America. That was mm-hmm. a true invasion. Yeah, mm-hmm. and often depending on the climate, Africanized bees don't even seek a cavity. Sometimes they just develop their comb exposed, right? Yep, and and holes in the ground. You can find them in many different places. Yeah, sometimes yeah. they don't even need a yeah a. a, a a place to be in they can stay outside yeah so what kind of hives uh, did your family use i uh, lung straw uh, was, uh, yep yep that's some interesting stuff right there okay i also read somewhere that that you did some research or might have an answer to why honeybees washboard I true? didn't do a research. I did a did video you? about it. And oh, just okay. <laughs> uh, the research was the, uh, if I remember, that was a long time ago. It was uh, the research from, I forgot the name of the researcher, but he, he was trying to figure it out what the wash behavior was. So mm-hmm. he compared uh, the colonies in the wild and apparently the in the wild, what he could, see is that they do this to make the entrance a little smoother 
he smoothed the entrance for whatever reason and he was hypothesizing is to better to put the firm ones there so they can localize the area better or something yeah, like that that's exactly it i read something recent about the same thing that they were marking the entrance to make it uh easier for foraging bees to return and identify their proper cavity to move yeah. into, which i really liked actually that explanation but how would we you know even prove that that pheromone was on the surface there yeah that's the that's a speculation i don't think we have enough to 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 do for sure to say with a certain level of certainty that that's the only reason we we know you if you observe them you, they use the front legs a lot with the sensors here and there is a combination and when they put up uh i always forget the name of that uh the abdomen yeah, the abdomen, but there is a... Oh, the Nazanoff gland? Nazanoff, Nazanoff. So okay. there is a combination of potential chemicals they can they are using at that point. And so, yeah, I'm, I, know, I don't think we have enough data to guarantee that it's only for localization. So that's one of the mysteries that I get asked that question a lot, actually. And I always say, oh, the experts are divided. They don't know for sure. Yeah, we, know normally, yeah. we know they're lining up. For those who are scratching their heads and wondering what we're even talking about, yeah. often you'll see um, the bees on the landing board or right at the entrance. Or even sometimes, if you have an observation hive, you'll note that they do this just inside the entrance, too. That'll be my but, point. But you don't see them, for example, which kind of reinforces this thought line. You don't see them two thirds of the way up doing washboarding on the interior surface of the hive. So it is kind of an interesting, one of the mysteries yet unsolved. Unsolved. So, yeah. and there's a, uh, there's a big deal right now happening. Do you know what I'm about to ask you about? Australia. Yes. New South Wales, <laughs> Australia, for those, uh, everybody's buzzing about it. Uh, they have varroa destructor mites. Now they had those sentinel hives. So they had a program for detecting mites early. And there's been a lot of research and technology committed to that too, detecting mites when they come into a hive. What are your thoughts on what's going on there right now? What are they facing and where do you think that's going to go? Uh, my thoughts are based on my experience with the spread of varroa along the years. And when, when we talk with the, with the, I didn't talk uh, with the beekeeper I talk with people that talk with the beekeeper, but the information that I got was that the colony they found for Rua was already with high level, like 10, 15 per 100 bees. Wow. Meaning if, if that colony was that high already, that means Varua was there multiplying for a couple of cycles already. And if, it, if it, I've let Varua kept with that amount of time, that might very likely reach the wild colonies in the surroundings too. And I think when that, when that happened, I feel that it's kind of hard to avoid the worst. Um, I'm cheering for Australia. I know the team there is really into this and they are killing thousands and thousands uh, of bees trying to contain the problem mm -hmm. but when we're talking about varroa um, and talk about honeybees and the potential that bees have to spread things uh, you know i came I, i'm doing this for too long and i i think i i'm not uh, optimistic about that i think australia is gonna have uh varroa now i hope not um, i hope not fingers crossed but i have to guess i'm not uh, optimistic mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're even forbidding people from doing routine hive maintenance. They can't draw honey off. They can't uh, inspect their hives. They're only authorized, uh, look, and this is in the quarantine zone. Uh, the only authorized uh, incursion into the hive is to do a treatment for varroa mites or a count. Are they authorizing a treatment right now for those who have found it, or they just have to turn it over to the government? I think they are they are uh, allowing some special authorization for those. I, I, I talk 
with the gentleman, apparently they're receiving some treatments from companies there. So I'm assuming if they were able to import, they might going to be getting some special permit from the government just as an emergency. But I'm not completely sure about that. Uh, but they need to do it. You know, they need to contain the, uh, uh, that would be my advice to treat, uh, you know, at least one year and make sure just to improve, to increase the chances to, to full, to eliminate, because it's very, uh, very easy to, to, uh, for example, it's not a molecular, um, assay that detect varroa. It, it normally is with sugar shake or alcohol shake. And those you can, you know, as a very low uh, infestation can pass away. You know, the best, the best way to detect very low infestation is to put a, a you know, uh, a board with the glue there and it's wait there and treat the whole thing and see if something drops at least one you can get one that's the the best way for you to detect low level of row infestation because the sugar shake or the alcohol shake you might miss it and if that's the way they're doing there you know low infestation is going to pass and when the that pass the, the quarantine is done you know mm. so you're saying like the mite counting boards those that have the adhesive treatment on them would be a much better way to detect because we're only looking to see if even one is in there right yes for low for low rates for low detection you know for low infestation levels i think the best way is to uh, put the board there and and treat and and then so see if there's a mite drop yeah yep that's the best way to get low infestation levels what would be your recommendation for a treatment for the con to contain the whole thing or it's a, when you put that board in there and you want to, now for, not to contain everything, but somebody's got them, they're in New South Wales. What are the protocols they're thinking about for a treatment for killing the mites? Do you know? Well, and this, at this level, with the bees they have there, they never face varroa. Right now, those bees are very likely very sensitive to varroa. They, they, and, and, and I was, would love to know more if there is any test about the genetic of the varroa itself, because sometimes you can, based on the genetic of varroa, to try to identify perhaps where that came from. Because, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, I would go easy because it, it, it is so, mm, and I'm, well, specu it's a, it's a, I'm speculating here a lot. Yeah, it's a, it's a problem because what can happen is people can panic. Yeah. Then they just shotgun effects, treat everything they come across because these are livelihoods that are impacted there with the commercial beekeepers. And they're not too happy about, obviously, about it at all, but they'll all want to move fast and try to mitigate or stop Varroa altogether. And as you kind of alluded to, I think, uh, not all varroa are the same. Like even the pathogens that they carry, uh, they're not all as potent as some that have been around for a long time in other parts of the world. So they may be even a mild uh, varroa mite as far as the pathogens they carry with them, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah the bees were never exposed to those kind of pathogens too. So there's going to be a very hard heat just like we have here in the past, if that's is going to that direction, it's gonna have very high mortality of bees with these viruses, the formal wing A and all those strains that Australia don't have and everything else that come with Varroa. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I don't have a recommendation. I, you know, I would go ballistics to try to, but what, what it means to go ballistic is also a, a question mark in my mind because is the livelihood of beekeepers there because i don't know about uh, you know if people are going to buy the honey after that if they're going to trust the beekeepers after that mm. so uh, what's the what's the impact of going ballistic and just treat everything with with the uh, emitrax for example or mm -hmm. if they got a special authorization you know there's a whole industry that people trust for a specific reason 
that they no, don't have those kind of chemicals because they don't have varroa. But in, now after that, you know, what's going to happen with the industry? So mm -hmm. I am in contact with uh, one of the people, the official people from the government there that work with the, and she, she, I don't know if I'm allowed to say her name yet, but so I'm going to keep it. But as she's coming to my channel soon. I don't know when. So she's going to bring real life information from directly from Australia to see how, how they're dealing with that. And, and I don't know exactly when, but I think it's going to be next week or the other week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. People are hungry for information right now. So yeah. if you're listening or watching, there is going to be a link down in the video description. And it is the government website that updates on what precautions you have to take, what's allowed, what's not allowed, and it is updated. So we'll put that government link down there. And I'm really looking forward to, as you, as you said, the interview that you're going to have there. So if you guys aren't subscribing already to Inside the Hive TV, now would be the time if you don't want to miss that interview. So there, I just took care of that. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So. <laughs> Um, and I'm really good. Now, did they reach out to you then? No, I know her for a long time. Uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I work with Apimonia, the international beekeeping. Oh, okay. so, and so I know people from many different areas in the beekeeping world. And I reach out, what's going on? Can I get your interview information? And she said, hold on. We are so busy here now. I can't do anything. Talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> okay. So, All right. Yeah. Busy, that's going to be, yeah. And they should be conservative, you know, until they've really kind of got a plan in place before they start. I'm sure okay. the local yeah. media is all over them. Everybody wants to talk to everybody in Australia right now because it's kind of novel. Uh, there's only one other nation, I believe, and it's in Africa that's completely free of varroa destructor mites. Uh, but they're not a big commercial beekeeping, you know, yeah. uh, nation. So uh, there's so much going on. So, that leads us to other things. Um, a lot of questions that I get, and this is going to be a segue into research that you're doing uh, with the company that you currently work for. People often ask, uh, hey, they're getting used beekeeping equipment from people, uh, or they want to take honey from somewhere else, and they want to transfer it into a hive in a different bee yard. And uh, I always caution them about diseases that could be transmitted with the equipment and with honey even. And so other people think, well, honey is, kind of defends itself. What could possibly be in it? And so this is going to lead us to American fowl brood. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about the progress we're making against American fowl brood and why maybe it's not a great idea to accept and use old hive equipment from your grandfather, your great grandfather, although Whenever AFB, when did AFB come to the United States? When did they identify it? So that was a long time ago. I don't even remember when. But that was before I came to the United States and started to work with that. Uh, the B was what thirty years ago. I, I'm I'm not sure. What I what I know is that is everywhere, and in very low amounts, and just waiting for the opportunity to grow. Mm -hmm. Uh, American fall brood is a, a bacterial disease uh, and it's the only one from, from the brood diseases that form a spore. The bacteria form a spore is an encapsulation, is a, is a way for them to, to be protected from the environment around them. It's a very tough, very difficult to, to manage, very difficult to kill. And that's the, the main problem with the American fall brood. Once they sporulate, they can stay in the environment for almost 40 years. So, and the only way to get rid of it is burning everything. So that's why we have in some, some places around the world, uh, in the US, for example, in some states, it is mandatory to, to burn the hides when you detect them. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is the, the, the problems with the American fall brood, they just dissolve the whole hive basically when the when the uh, a combination of the spores and a very susceptible genetic background of the bees that you have mm -hmm. you have those episodes where the whole brood just dissolved mm -hmm. and 
it is manageable. There are, it's not a, a big concern among commercial beekeepers. I see a lot of between uh, um, sideliners and backyard beekeepers. Uh, people manage them very well with, but the way people do things are not, you know, normally the best way to do with antibiotics. We don't want to be keeping antibiotics in our hives. I'm, I'm the one, I'm a, one of the guys that I'm completely against that kind of thing. I try as much as I can, uh, like with European fall brood or any kind of disease, if you can find ways that we can treat them, you know, in a way that we don't contaminate our the products that we want to consume from the hives, I'm totally in. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was very enthusiastic about this new technology that are coming to the market that I decide even to join the company. That's something that I normally don't do it. I, I just did this time because it, it is a very interesting technology that is a result from the discoveries from the last 10 years of the honeybee research world that allow us now to do vaccines for honeybees. So there is a new vaccine coming to the market pretty soon uh, against American fall brood. And is quite interesting the way biology works. Uh, biology of honeybee, the social organism. Uh, if do, I think we have time, can I elaborate a little bit on yeah, uh, the biology of that? Yeah. Oh yeah, it is. It's quite fascinating to me how the social organism is able to defend themselves. We knew a long time ago for myself as a researcher for example when i started my research career in honeybee with honeybees and here in 2006 2007 when i was in the beltsville lab the usda in beltsville lab we do experimentations uh, with colonies uh, i worked with viruses in the past uh, i'm a virologist with iapv and we am always frustrated that I work with the hive one year and I try to use that hive the next year. That hive do not respond to the virus the same way or mm -hmm. the bacteria. They, they have some level of protection. They, they, and we never know if that was something that we are just observing was a mistake of our part. But today we know for sure that it's something called transge transgenerational immune priming. Honeybee colonies, the social organisms, are able to, to immunize themselves and transfer that immunization power, let's put this way, to the next generation of bees. And, and we, we knew that for a while that, that the event happened was a fact, but nobody knew the mechanism behind it, the molecular mechanisms, mechanisms behind this thing. And it was about seven years ago or something that Dr. Dialo Freitag in Finland he started to figure it out the mechanism behind it that allow us today after this seven years of research to, to, to produce the first ever vaccine for insect ever created. And I thought, I thought that was so cool and so promising, not, not only for the, the honeybee world, but also for it's the first vaccine for insects. You know, there is so much more that we can potentially do with that technology that I decide, oh, I'm, I'm in. I want to know, I want to be part of that. This is history. I'm going to be part of history too. I'm going to help them as much as I can. And they, in their way, and they go full time now. They, they pass regulatory now. It almost, I think next month, we're going to get the uh, authorization from the USDA. The veterinary uh, branch of the, the USDA is going to approve uh, the registration of the product. Um, mm -hmm. And people are going to start selling. Uh, and it, is, uh, it is amazing. It is amazing we, what we can do. But the biology is fun because, you know, uh, worker bees are dealing with uh, all the, you, you probably have talked with people at home about hygienic behavior. Uh, you know, the colonies are able to detect problems with the brood. The workers go there, detect the problems. Some of the, the broods are removed. 
And in the process of removing that contaminated, they consume part of that. They consume mm -hmm. part of that just to, to recycle the things, but not only for recycle as we previously was thinking. Apparently the, the workers are able to consume that because they need to digest this that come back to the hypopharyngeal gland to form a special jelly that they're going to give it to the queen. That, that special jelly is going to create the fat bodies of the queen. They're going to go to the eggs and that egg is going to be protected against mm -hmm. that disease they have. It. Basically, that's the pathway uh, uh, transmitting this and they uh, and this researcher in Finland they she she was able to follow with antibodies all the the trajectory of these pieces of bacteria from from the worker bee to the queen to the to the ovaries of the queen mm -hmm. is a fascinating research I published two videos about I, that in my channel already mm -hmm. and I'm gonna be as long as we have more evidence and more publications, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be making more videos about that because I think is 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 fascinating itself. I mm. think the, the the title of the video. Um, what's the? Well, title? we can we will link those videos yeah. down in the description so people won't have to hunt them down. Yeah, it's honeybee queens vaccinate the young bees naturally. So I go yeah. over all the all the, the, the science behind it, that. Yeah. And there is some overview too, if you guys want to see in Dalen.com. Dalen is the name of the company, Dalen.com. Yep. Dalen okay. Animal Health. So this is the first honeybee vaccine ever. A lot of people, I'm glad you kind of described how they're gonna spread that around in the hive through the nurse bees and everything, because a lot of people in their minds were all saturated with seeing needles going into people's yeah, arms. Yeah, yeah. How do you vaccinate bees? You know, so this is actually going to be fed to the bees. It's going to be fed to the queen. And so we prepare a special candy. Um, and if you go to the, the website, dalen.com and go to science, you can see there uh, how, how the, to deliver the the, the, the candy but basically what we we do is to generate a very special candy and it's a normal candy with you know sugar and water and make it the queen candy the way you normally do the only thing the only difference is going to be you're going to get a little liquid the vaccine itself 50 doses you put in this mix mix very well with the candy and mm -hmm. then you separate six grams of of the candy and put in the cage with some attendance attendant bees and the queen and you need to leave that attendance to feeding the queen for five to seven days so a lot of that candy that specific candy go to the fat bodies of the queen and then every single egg after that is is kind of protected against american fall brood mm -hmm. so then um who's this for who's going to be using this first well so the fascination of this is that every every year we discover something new, which was encouraging at the beginning. Okay, we have a new technology, we have the pathway, we we can generate a vaccine against American fowl brood, which is a very dangerous disease that we don't have much control mm -hmm. over, only need to burn. Okay, so we have that. But apparently the data is showing you that once you're vaccinated with that vaccine against American fowl brood you also get protection against other bacteria like European fall brood. Mm -hmm. So oh the it, same the same the, one the same yeah. vaccine. You're and, and, and an American fall brood. Yeah, it makes sense to me because the immune system of honeybees are not like ours. It's, mm -hmm. it's not specific. It's not the creator antibody that is specific to the pathogen that you put in. They're right. kind of broad there are pathways that are activated, one pathway towards viruses, one pathway to funguses, one pathway to bacteria, but the vaccine is gonna activate the pathway against bacteria. So there is a big chance that the bacteria pressure, the vaccine is gonna take care of basically, and I am speculating here, we need more data on that, but my guess will be that the vaccine is gonna activate the pathway for bacteria and 
most of the bacteria that are pathogens to honeybees might, might have some effect on that. Mm -hmm. And some people are probably wondering, because um, we notice American fowl brood when the brood fails, when you see that greasy concave surface over the pupae. And uh, then we have the rope test. And then we've got, of course, these kits that yeah, I we have the, kits around, the field test kits. Um, but as you mentioned, it's much more prevalent than that, uh, that these are sublethal levels that exist on many hives. So how many hives would you speculate? Do we even know? I mean, how pervasive it is at lower doses, which means it's kind of semi-dormant, but present. So when they're in a weakened state, then it would rise and take over the brood. Is that right? How does that happen? Yeah, um, absolutely. You, you have, you hit the point there. When we use very sensitive equipment like molecular tests, we are able to detect almost half of every single sample we have. We can find American fowl brood with the right. um, molecular techniques. So we know is right there, it's causing some damage and the bees very likely defending themselves and, but you don't see. So it's, it's a kind of subclinical effect that you don't see, but you know the bees are consuming resources to defend themselves about that. Mm -hmm. And the hope now is that the bees are not gonna be able, don't need anymore if they're vaccinated to use resources, defense resources against that. They can use more of the resources against whatever viruses they have or, or other things coming from mites. And at the end of the day, at the end of the year, you, you might be able to see some, some numbers going up like honey production and things like that. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my guess. And I'm really looking forward to see the beekeepers start to use this in, 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 in quantity so we can get the, those numbers in and see what the real effect is. Mm -hmm. So are you working with um, apiaries that have large numbers of colonies where you could do field studies? How oh, they yeah. They, together with the field trials they are doing for the regulatory already, uh, we have some um, program now that uh, we call the exchanging programs with commercial beekeepers, uh, commercial beekeepers that want to try that uh, for free in the first year. We, there is some requirements to enter in the program. So if you are a commercial beekeeper watching that and curious about it, uh, please contact me. Uh, we are selecting a group of beekeepers to put in, in their operations with thousands of samples. We're gonna give thousands of samples because uh, the company is very positive about what the, the vaccine can do. Hmm. So we're donating this and in exchanging, we, we want some information about the beekeeper in the operation. And, but uh, it, it's quite interesting. Pretty soon we're gonna have thousands and thousands of hives vaccinated all over the United States now. Hmm. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Since, um, so that's foul brood, but it's often said that the varroa destructor mite really isn't killing the bees itself so much as <laughs> the pathogens that it generates into the system of that bee, right? So the metabolism of the bee is challenged by the pathogens that are transmitted. Is that something that also a vaccine could answer? In other words, these pathogens that are spread by varroa mites, could we be treating those rather than even going after the mite? What, well, what, what, how does that work or could it work? It's a fantastic work uh, uh, question. I, I had questions myself. And, and, and that's the fascination I have about this new technology because every day we have new questions and, and the potential keep going up and up. As I said before, the way I see now with the data we have, with this cross protection that we, we got when you vaccinate against one, against American fall brood, and you get some results against European fall brood, that starts to tell me that there is so much more that we can do and this is the, the first one, you know, we, we very likely in the near future gonna have combination of vaccines, vaccines against uh, European fall brood and American fall brood combined, if we need it. We, mm -hmm. I know there is in a pipeline right now uh, against other diseases of honeybees. There are some speculations that we can even use the, 
the vaccine pathways to target some proteins of the mites itself. Mm -hmm. you know, so it, it opens so many doors for potential use of the technology, but we need to start somewhere. And because the, the, the technology was discovered with American fall brood, it's, it, makes, it makes much more sense to target that one first because we already have data to go to the regulatory path. But after the regulatory path is open, man, it's just, we can produce so many other things with the technology and we are really excited and there are people working hard uh, on those pipelines. But I'm pretty sure we're going to have other vaccines for other pathogens. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the risks when using vaccines? In other words, is the only risk that it might fail or could it possibly have a negative impact? On Good question, oh, Fred. Good question. Because the, something that concerns me where we don't have much data is because we're going to be activating the uh, immune system of the honeybees. And that means the bees going to consume, you know, it, it's part of the resources of the honeybees anyways. Uh, but the test done so far didn't indicate any side effects so far, which make me very happy. Like there is no mortality of the queen that was increased with the vaccinated queens. Uh, they, they test things in the honey. The honey was perfect. So all the regulatory tests USDA required, uh, they let animal health pass pretty, pretty good. But it's still, we, we're going to have much more questions in the future. Like I have questions, uh, you know, uh, about if there is any side effect. So far, we didn't see any, but activating the same pathway over and over might, might have a problem. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. I, I really going to need to wait for that. That's interesting stuff. Yes, it is. It's really good. <laughs> okay. Oh, and. To answer a practical question, should people be shifting capped frames of honey around to different hives? If so, why is that a benefit? And if not, what are the risks, do you think? What well, could be carried with the honey? I would avoid that. Um, oh, I know there is... If you're a backyard beekeeper, I would avoid that. If you're... Because, yes, honey is have high amount of sugar. It can kill lots of the, the majority of the bacteria out there. But for example, it cannot kill American fowl brood spores. That one example. And also cannot kill viruses. The viruses is going to be there protected and the bees going to consume them. Some viruses are, um, if it, the honey is high quality honey, they have some lower pH, some viruses are able to be killed by the honey too. I made a couple of videos about that. There is some publications showing you that acidity is able to kill some of, to open the capsid of the virus. So normally the, cap, the virus is a protein capsid and have the genetic material inside. And what the researchers shown was that when you're in an acidic environment, that those capsules, they open. And once they open, the, they can't infect the, the, the cell anymore. And, and we know honey has a pH that is a little acid and might be uh, helping with that. Uh, but it's not all viruses, not all the families. So I'm pretty sure there are plenty of pathogens that is still available in the honey or in wax or in, in the woods there that, you know, the bee is going to be in contact to, the new bee is going to be in contact to, and it's going to spread. That's the, that's the way humans spread things around is also through sharing old equipment. Um, from my knowledge, from commercial beekeepers, I know them they have systems where they, they, uh, use UV lights and they need that for the operation. Mm -hmm. uh, every time they buy equipment from somebody else, they go to these high containers and they, they use this. Uh, You're talking about irradiation as well? Yes, irradiation. They use okay. that. Yeah, because the and, ultraviolet spectrum that they use, if they were going to use UV lights, it would be the kind of thing where when they come on, that room needs to be sealed because yeah. it would be very intense. Yeah, but they use the radiation and they spend good amount of money, like twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year, only sterilizing equipment. And they and they say that 
that's worth it because when they don't do it, they lose much more than that mm-hmm. with, uh, with the colonists dying. Yeah, and, and they have to replace equipment with new equipment if they weren't sterilizing it. Is yeah. that the word? Sterilize or sanitize? Sterilization? I think you go with sterilization with sterilization. The, uh, irradiation is sterilization process. Okay. Yes. Okay. What else can we talk about? And for, people want are probably going to want to know what kind of bees do you keep? I already know the answer. Right now, none. <laughs> <laughs> And you even said one time that at the end of the day, you're so tired of dealing with bees. The last thing you want to do is face them when you get home. Uh, I work, you know, I work with commercial beekeepers most of the time, and it's just thousands yeah. of hives. And the, when I get home, the only thing I want is my TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you see it happen in the future? You ever see yourself keeping bees at home, or are yeah. you in an area where you could even keep them? Like, yeah, I, I yes, there are plans uh, to. Um, I'm, there is some plans that I can get. A, I need a property. I actually I don't have it because I don't have enough space. But once I move and I get a, enough, a bigger, I need a, I need a little piece of land. If I get a land, yeah, I will keep bees for sure. And very likely it's going to start with Italians. Yeah. Italians? Of yeah. All the bees. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's that maybe that's because that, my that's, i'm born christiani i'm and I'm, I'm half italian maybe that's yeah one. is that abus mellifera ligustica 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 okay you keep trying to keep all those things straight so and why would you pick those that's going to be something somebody's going to want to know uh i i like the since i got in the united states i got so connected with gentle bees uh, I, i'm used to to work with africanized and when i got here I, I really thought something was wrong with the bees here i need to kick them to see if they move <laughs> and i i in lagustica is pretty gentle and they have high honey production um and i i, I enjoy them I, I might got some russians too yeah i like bees so i'm probably gonna get a, a bit <laughs> a little bit of everything yeah i believe uh, the italians are the most popular nationwide they are yeah the okay they have it just so happened that the italians that i had early on in my beekeeping experience they were the hottest bees i ever had really they, they got so big the colonies were so huge and so populated they just became very aggressive i think they robbed every other colony in the area oh me just the numbers were huge and that was bad for my winners because we get a heavy winter here and the Italians just kept brooding up right into winter and then they consumed all the resources and that was it. So they weren't like, they didn't respond to environmental cues going into winter and the queen didn't hold back her productivity. Uh, where are you located? New uh, York? North Pennsylvania. Mm. In the snow belt right oh, near Lake yeah, Erie. It's pretty, it's pretty heavy, intense winter there, right? Yeah, we get over, we've had over a hundred inches of snow in a winter. And they keep building up? The Italians did. They brewed it up and wow. they didn't okay. slow down like uh, some of the others that I had. But of course, I quit them. So I don't know how they might have worked out. Maybe I quit them too soon. I don't know. But now I just deal with the bees that are already in my area. And uh, I bring in stock every now and again from survivor bees out of Texas, actually uh that do pretty well up here the weaver bee weaver oh bee weaver uh, yeah bees, yeah weaver, yeah he so those have done really well about. for me yeah pardon weaver know what he's talking about yeah yeah daniel weaver yeah good guy okay good guy good guy what else can we talk oh yeah i'm just gonna see if you happen to know something random here smoker fuel smoker fuel fine sometimes you said pine, <laughs> pine <laughs> shavings or pine needles? Pine needles. Pine needles. Okay. Which happens to be the most popular in the yep. country again. So I think you're following popular trends, Umberto. I think that you don't branch out very much to test things out. Like if I did uh, comfrey and dried out a bunch of comfrey leaves, is there anything to smoking fuel having any potential medicinal effect on a hive? medicinal potential with the smoke i don't think i have enough information to give it to you fred i okay um, good answer 
I'm a conservative. <laughs> I, and I, I'm on the kind of research that know the time that you need to know. I don't know. Yeah. And I am not afraid to say, I don't know. Well, there was, and also for those that are listening, they just published a, a list of all the different smoker fuels and how long they last and how dense the smoke was. They even, so they shot a light oh, through really? the smoke to determine how dense it was, how cool it was. So number one, I can just save you the time right now was cow manure. Cow manure? Yep. Dried, dried cow manure. I want to so, I want to read the article. I don't know about so it. Good. I believe it's in the uh, American Bee Journal. Bee Journal. Okay. Yeah, American Bee Journal. So, um, so you can't help me with the smoke. I'm sorry about that. What else? So, did you say you used to work at the Beltsville lab? Yes. Uh, and when I arrived here, I spent four years in the Beltsville lab. Then I moved to the Army lab in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Then I moved, then I opened a company to take care of mosquitoes for a year and a half. Then I gave up because bees always come back to my life. <laughs> Wait a second. Let's back up on the mosquitoes. All right. Did that have something to do with what you did with the army? Not exactly. Uh, that's a long story. It seems <laughs> like soldiers would want to be not no, no. It, let, me, let me yeah people i think people in us doesn't know those things too much i think that's a good time for you can explain that so the, the united states army has a b lab and then people might not know that there is a is a is a food security issue if you have problems with the bees so the army has a b lab and that take care of bee research that you know to increase to increase uh, honeybee health and that's a is a consortium in north carolina is a honeybee research north carolina honeybee research consortium which is the army lab the university of north carolina in greensboro and university of north carolina and lab, uh, two universities and the army lab and they get together to to create these consortiums where they do research together in collaboration and in one of the grants from the army, I, I was able to get and move to North Carolina for two years to do research in that beautiful consortium there with David Tarpey, Dr. Oliver Rupel, uh, Mike Simone that now is at the, the USDA in, in Baton Rouge. So I, I worked with all those folks there in North Carolina a long time ago, and it was a lot of fun. I was working with viruses too there. So what came of that? What uh, what big accomplishment occurred while you were there? When I was in North Carolina, I I was working with uh, IAPV. We we publish we publish several papers with uh, is Israeli acute paralysis viruses, trying to understand how the immune system of honeybees fight a, a virus disease. That's we we. We published a lot about the immune system of honeybees, which genes were activated, what genes were not activated in an in infection with the uh, uh, Israeli acute paralysis virus. Hmm. Now, does a honeybee have an individual HP, an individual immune system, or do they have kind of a collective immune system? They have both. Each okay. each bee itself have their own immune system in the molecular level, in a cellular level. And, but it's the fun part is that also those things connected with the social organism, the social organism have also, we call social defense, immune defense, social immune defense is like, and they're able to share uh, different compounds. They have something that we call the immune gut, you know, they, they share a lot of those compounds and the infections. There is you know, grooming, there is a lot of ways for the social organisms to defend themselves against diseases in many different ways. There is even uh, altruistic uh, behavior where the bees feel they're super sick. They don't want to stay around and contaminate the other members. They mm -hmm. just flew away to, to die alone, which, mm -hmm. is, which is fascinating to me. What kind of uh, brain activity need to be triggered for that to happen, you know, because it's not an easy decision to make. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a question that uh, every beekeeper gets asked today. Did they fix colony collapse disorder? I, I'm not a, and I'm not a believer of colony collapse disorder. Thank Maybe you. I, 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 I don't think that ever exists. 
So do you think it was a mistake to ever title it that, to call it that? I think there was a lot of enthusiasm be- among the beekeepers in the past that, you know, uh, it, uh, human beings, everybody have their own biases. There is a big buzz and a lot of spotlights and people, I don't know. I would. I was there. I follow as a as a student. I was not in a top, you know, commanding, but I I could see a, a lot of the behind the scenes. And today, if you ask me, if I no, I, I think it was more. Uh, of course, there was a problem going on, and people mm-hmm. got attention, but nothing that was super special. That was right. different from past events that we have. Mm-hmm. In the past, we j- couldn't detect, I guess, or th- didn't have that much power or attention from the media. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm, I'm not a big, uh, mm-hmm. yay, CCD special. No, no. Yeah, well, I can say this, that had it not come to the fore, had Mr. Hackenberg out of the state of Pennsylvania not called it that, um, I would not have gotten involved with bees. Because that's kind of the you know the turning point where it got into all these documentaries, Silence of the Bees, the Vanishing of the Bees, yeah, all these different things came out, and that's what caused me to go out and walk fields and look for bees. I didn't know anything about bees, front you know, but in my head, I should be seeing bees around here. There's no bees. I have to find out what's going on. This is colony collapse. So it, it's a it's a pretty funny beginning because I was so ignorant you know, about bees, but I like contacted the Department of Agriculture and everything. We had this talk when you interviewed me for, uh, for your channel. Yeah. But uh, had it not been for CCD and that, that label and that kind of uh, the sensation it caused through the media, I think a lot of people became beekeepers. Uh, yeah. Because of that, so. Even my, my transition to United States was because of that, the USDA were looking for someone and I, I fulfilled the gap and it was very, traumatic to be honest you know because you need to leave your family behind and there is this call and i said no i'm not gonna let the bees die i'm gonna help with whatever i have yeah and i and i did that move and 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 i'm happy that happened because i i i like bees i like the the research i like how you know the spread of beekeeping and the bee culture is because of that but you know i i like the how things end up uh, you know, much more people know about bees today and care about them and understand the importance of bees, which is great. Oh, yeah. And so that's, I think that was the positive part of this big bus that we have in the past. Yeah. And uh, social media has yeah, risen was, was dramatically. Raising, yeah, yeah. So the, the transfer of information and sharing visually videos, videos, you and I are talking right now, being heard by people we will never meet. Yep. I mean, this is things have changed dramatically so that's why it's so important to have good people to talk to they're doing meaningful research and when you get this information out the minute you think it you can put it out there which might not always be a good thing but if people can slow down and wait till they've worked it out and they know what they're talking about they can put it out there and then we all benefit from it yeah i always invite people to be careful with the internet information and, and and science science news you know everything today is so much catchy and things like that and Mm -hmm. science is about takes a long time to confirm things and there is no breaking news breaking news normally one article of one scientist that need to be repeated many times right by many different people in different places and take time and that's the beauty of the scientific method when somebody's done something we can we can repeat the test we can pick it apart and find out what was wrong with the way it was conducted, or we can reinforce it and get similar or the same results as we get down the line. So it's a great way uh, to do things. So what would you like to tell people about bees or beekeeping or anything else to close up your interview? Close up my final thoughts about bees. Well, I I assume you, your audience enjoy bees. I would say, keep doing it. Keep, keep enjoying it. Um, uh, my advice, I, I think just a complementation where we start right now, uh, working with beekeepers in the, in the academia and the industry now for so long, I feel like that 
great great number of the problems we have is solvable if you know what you're doing if you study and you have so much information out there uh it's just a matter of to understand the scientific method and how you know be biology because you need to be really connected with your environment and, and if you get protocols from another area very likely you're not going to work for you mm -hmm. so it, it is a process to for you to become a, a beekeeper you know you need to you need to understand the bees and the environment around you and i see a lot of beekeepers trying to keep old protocols from older generations where the environment was completely different and the systems and they just just collapse and that explains a lot of the mortality we have out there i know because we are able to fix many of these problems in the field some of the beekeepers will never admit that <laughs> but there is there are you know there is some some good information coming from from labs and the usda and the universities and there is this anti-science thing going on don't go that direction just you know stick with the the scientific method that you're going to be okay i'm not going to let you go that quick how does, i'm not going i, I, how does, I, have, <laughs> I have half of my drink how does, keep... how does and let's see how to wear this how does anti science, the anti science movement, how does that manifest itself in like beekeeping? Does that mean we're just kind of going by feelings and gut? Yeah, and that's, some, some beekeepers get really upset um, because that, uh, they want to change the way they do things. And most of the time, the, the way they generate the protocols is a from from family business for a long time was mm -hmm. in different environment in an environment that we didn't have the problems we have today like it was mm -hmm. much easier to keep bees in the past mm -hmm. you know the environment was much easier put the bees there and go away go fishing go do mm -hmm. whatever you want to do go back a couple months later and it just collect the mm -hmm. benefits of that you didn't it didn't need to do anything much today you just need to be a beekeeper like you need to really take care and pay attention and calculate things ahead and mm -hmm. look at the weather every day and see what's going on yeah it's interesting you say that because when we talk about these multi-generational beekeepers my grandmother kept bees in vermont and um agriculture has changed and the chemical load in the environment has dramatically changed, completely. changed. Completely. yeah so yeah, that's a good point uh this isn't your grandfather's beekeeping anymore yeah. and because... then they got frustrated because and they feel that people are trying to impose things to them uh, it, actually what what i'm trying to do i'm trying to help because mm -hmm. I know I can help, I know I can fix, and I know the struggle. The guy is losing money. You know, there is mm -hmm. is is a you know low income and struggling, and people are upset. And and I don't know what's going on with the world. Yes, maybe people don't understand science very well, or maybe how science news are delivered today is a part of the problem. Like with this breaking news that I was talking about, you know, is everything is so much clickbait. Mm -hmm. And so people start to see one day uh, coffee is good for something. Coffee is not good for something. And yeah, then, I don't listen. Yeah, I don't listen to that stuff. So but then with time, people start to think, well, science doesn't know what they're doing because one day is yes. Another day is <laughs> no. Another day is yes. <laughs> uh, and the truth is, is a is a path uh, and it's not black and white. And it take a long time for us to, you know, when is when you got the truth, we can deliver that and repeat over and over and right. over. Right. It holds over. up over time. Yes. Right. It goes past yeah. the initial presentation as part of it, but the fact that it holds up as more people use it or, or demonstrate or practice the same thing and it continues to work, that's how it proves out. But and there I'm is a gonna... second there is a second layer on that problem with the beekeeping itself, the beekeeping industry. It's not like this is a different industry. It's a is an industry with a wild animal. It's not like chicken and cows that we can control everything. Everything they eat, we know. Everything, you know, the genetics, we know everything. And the environment, we can confine them. It's a different industry. And there is so much more variables, which creates so much more different situations that the beekeepers and the researchers need to face. 
that's why you have a very different results in field trials, for example, with different, uh, you know, we never know what's going to happen. We really never know exactly what's happening, what, where the, those bees are going, what they get them food from. You know, if there is one plant right. that, you know, have a chemical that messed up with whatever you're testing, done. But that doesn't mean the thing doesn't work. <laughs> it's just you were in an environment that that doesn't work. But then beekeepers start to think that we are messing them around. We just don't know what they're talking about. So there is this layer of is a wild animal and there is much more variables comparing with right. other industries. Right. Extremely complex. And that's, yep. yeah, exactly. Like these are not like any other livestock. Yeah. The state of Pennsylvania with, is considered livestock, with, but yeah. your cow doesn't fly three miles and visit a creek that has stuff in it that we don't know anything about that suddenly yeah. made that cow better, you know, but bees do. And so one colony right next to another will be just going gangbusters and bringing in pollen that are colors that we don't see. And then the one next to it is bringing in tan pollen or brown pollen because it's on yeah. clover. And they are, you're right. It's their access to the environment and the impact of the environment on the bees that is so wide and varied that it creates this endlessly complex situation. Yeah, we know, for, for example, we go to the laboratory and we are able to do in a laboratory conditions, we know something works, you know, we can repeat, control. repeat, yeah. repeat, and we, okay, we know it works, exists. But when we go to the field, a lot of times, we know it's there because we know in a laboratory, you, you can demonstrate that. But for mm -hmm. some reason in the field, that's mess, you know, is, is hided by something more complex. And it's a challenge, a few trials are is a, a big challenges, mm -hmm. but I got yeah. I got people upset with me all the time. And depending on the regions and where you go in the United States, I I got people pointing guns to my face and just just not fun sometimes. <laughs> Are you saying not literal guns? Literal guns twice, yeah. I don't like researchers get out of my property. That kind of stuff. Oh, because. <laughs> <laughs> That does not sound like fun. I was thinking about taking a trip with you, Umberto, but now I don't know. Well, don't know if, you're, um, yo, if you're bringing me there because of... No, uh, I learned I learn pretty hard. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes you, you want to help so hard and you, you, you know, you just see that the guy next door, you come to visit someone and you, okay, there is this other guy. I'm already here. Let's, let's knock his door. Let's see. I want to talk to him. And then uh, you got a very interesting reception. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, not everybody wants to. That's like, see, I get nobody ever points a gun at me, but it, I do get frequent comments on my channel. If I say register your apiary with the Department of Agriculture, which is what they want us to do. And uh, now you're in the fold. Now you're going to get information. For example, American Fowl Brood, if that shows up, you'll be in the contact list that your area is at risk and you can start to keep your bees in or whatever for the period while they treat it or, or deal with it. They have a treatment regimen for the other colonies that are not showing symptoms, but the colony that actually has foul brood gets destroyed. And that has to be observed by our state inspectors. But there are people that think you just invited the man into your backyard and they have no business in my backyard. Well, if it weren't for them doing that and containing foul brood, you would be hearing much more about it. In other words, it, it used to be very common. It used to wipe out entire operations. Yeah. The, I, fact, the fact that they've been evolved is why it's so rare today to lose an entire apiary and adjacent apiaries to foul brood infestation. So the people that are rejecting this, they think it's somehow giving up your freedoms or giving up your independence. It's really not because in my state, the whole reason we have this inspection program under the Department of Agriculture is because beekeepers got together and requested it of the Department of Agriculture. So that entity was established at the request of beekeepers who wanted to know what was going on with other beekeepers and that we would have a collective approach to dealing with problems as they arise. Yeah, so. well, can we elaborate on that too? Uh, do we have time? Or? Okay, go ahead. Because <laughs> <laughs> you touch, we touch base a, a very important thing. Um, 
I have this deal with, with beekeepers and commercial beekeepers, whatever happened in the apiary, stay in the apiary. And it took me a long time to get the trust from the beekeepers. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is the other side too. Um, yes, I, I think beekeepers need to learn from the bees a little bit more. Like cooperation is an important part of how the bees survive in nature. And I think this is part of beekeepers maybe should be working together with other beekeepers and people that work with bees. So together the industry can be stronger. Mm-hmm. But there, there is one reason and I, beekeepers, there is a little problem with academia too. Uh, and I need uh, to be completely fair and kind of, I don't, do not justify the things that I see in the field from beekeepers. But I think I know where the things uh, come from sometimes. There is a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there is some people from academia that I think they don't, they don't have the, the way, they have their biases and they come with as uh, authorities. And sometimes they fail to demonstrate them to the beekeepers in a practical way or, and they, 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 they lose the trust. And they have their biases too, and like they need, they need to keep doing research based whatever they found money for. And there is a little, a little problem with that area because it's some some places we don't know where the money coming from, and beekeepers are really aware of those things. Some commercial guys. So, and I, I like to to mention these things because I like to try to when I'm trying to tackle a problem, I, I try. I, biases are something that everybody has but you know we need to see every single side and yeah it's minimal there is but it's still a little problem with academia too with the way they they communicate with the beekeepers and trying to understand the beekeepers problems in the field and Mm -hmm. don't go to them as authorities and without you know you need to you need to understand you need to understand your client let's put this way Mm -hmm. Excellent. Is that, is that it? Was that the last? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, again, okay. well. I, have, I have a drink here with me. I can continue for hours. That's what I do for a I, living. <laughs> <laughs> I never get tired of talking about bees, but people do get tired of listening to me on YouTube. Okay. But, but I want to thank you for doing this interview tonight because uh, we've covered so a lot of ground. There's a lot for people to digest and and pay attention to and follow up on my pleasure fred and uh, you know after i start on youtube i you know my my uh appreciation for the things that you do for example go super high because now i understand the amount of work and dedication and passion that need to be and uh, you know people might not realize that you know this kind of interviews and to keep a YouTube channel running consistently mm-hmm. demands a lot of dedication and work. And after I start to do it myself, my, well, you, you, I, I told you, you're, you're my fan. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Humberto. And uh, thank you for watching everyone. Go ahead and put your yeah. comments down below and uh, don't forget to subscribe to Inside the High TV and look at the links down in the video description. And we'll catch you later. We wish you all the best in beekeeping. Thank you for watching and listening. I invite you to check the video description for links that were mentioned in today's interview. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Umberto Boncristiani and will visit his YouTube channel for more information regarding critical scientific advancements related to honeybees. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this has been another episode of The Way to Bee.